one and all to this presentation by Stephanie Trenchard. This tonight is a series, a part of a series, for the Art Alliance of Contemporary Glass Wisconsin Artists Series. The Bergstrom Mahler Museum of Glass is really grateful to AACG for their continued support of our programs. Uh, without their support, this program simply wouldn't be possible. Uh, we've had great fortune already in this program, even though we had to, we've had to change how we're offering this program, uh, moving from an in-person uh, presentation style to an online presentation. We've really been quite fortunate that our wonderful artists have been so flexible to work with us, um, and Stephanie is no exception. Uh, for some of, some of you may be aware, Stephanie was scheduled and slated to be the second presentation in this series, and I believe her original presentation date was sometime in late uh, March, early spring. And unfortunately, with uh, the COVID-19 virus, we, we did have to, to postpone the presentation and ultimately shift it over to the Zoom, uh, to the Zoom platform. Uh, but Stephanie was super receptive to that, and so I'm very much appreciative of that. Uh, so tonight, uh, we will first start off with this wonderful video that Stephanie has put together uh, with the assistance, I believe, of uh, Jeremy as well. We'll show that video and then we'll jump into Stephanie's presentation. I'm really excited to talk about some of these new pieces I've been working on. This is a series called Coated Women that I've been developing for the past year. I've been doing sandcast glass for the last 25 years and I always do it with inclusions. It's a good technique for me because I like to do storytelling pieces and narrative work. I use um, high fire enamels to embellish their coats, um, their accessories, um, I use posture and facial expressions to tell the story of each woman, what, what we might imagine her history might be. Um, each one is sculpted from, with my team, um, sculpted from a rendering that I do. I might have to bring them to the marble. These are the wood molds that I use in order to make the impression in the sand. We basically put them into the sand, when the sand comes from the way, pack the sand around the wood mold, gently pull out the wood mold, leaving a nice impression in the sand. Then I use my paper stencils that I've cut out to apply the ground glass into the mold and then put it into four. Jeremy and I moved to Sturgeon Bay in 1997 with our two little kids and we started our glass studio. By 2002, we had a downtown building in the historic shipbuilding district. I'm originally a painter, but I've been working in glass for over 20 years. As a painter, I find glass to be a really wonderful medium in terms of the way it holds luminosity. I'm also interested in seeing the hand of the artist in the glass, which I can do with a paintbrush with the use of enamels. sample of a figure that we sculpted um, while we were visiting artists. Um, so you can see that the, all the details of the figure are created when we're sculpting it hot. After um, it's sculpted, we anneal it overnight in the kiln, and then the next day I have the luxury of painting it. One thing about these pieces that is kind of dear to my heart is that it represents women um, encased within a role or um, a, a norm, and they are all in their own way trying to break that norm. They're extended, they're pushing the boundaries of their form. Storytelling has always been really important to me as an artist, and glass work lends itself to that aspect in that it is a collaborative shared experience. I 
like to talk about women artists and women from art history in my work, but also contemporary women. And I have found that many of my students are women. Uh, when I was teaching in Thailand, most of the students were women, and the content became very personal and talked about issues of motherhood and identity. While I was at Corning doing some research in the Rock Hall Library, I was intrigued by the images of women working in the glass factories in the 19th century. From that research, I developed a whole line of work that became portraiture of these women and their imagined experience. The most important thing an artist can do is show up in their studio with a sense of curiosity and exploration. And from that, it's possible to manifest great work. Sometimes it's amazing, sometimes it's not. But either way, you gotta show up and you gotta get to work. Well, thank you for sharing that wonderful video, Stephanie. Before, before I turn the program over to Stephanie here, I do just want to let you all know, watching this evening, that we would love to have your questions um, that Stephanie can answer uh, either during the program or afterwards. You're welcome to use the Q&A feature that's built into Zoom to ask those questions. That Q&A feature is just located generally speaking, at the bottom of your Zoom panel if you're on a personal computer, uh, on a, a tablet or a phone, it also is generally on the bottom towards the right-hand side, just says Q&A. So we'd love for you to submit your questions and then we'll do our very best to get to all of those questions towards the end of the program today. Uh, Stephanie Trenchard has worked as a professional artist for over 30 years. She holds a BFA, from Illinois State University. She works in a multitude of mediums, including glass and oil painting. Along with her husband, um, the artist Jeremy Papelka Trenchard, has owned and operated a small glass studio in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, since 1997. And she continues to create and show glass internationally. Um, without further ado, welcome Stephanie Trenchard. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank um, the Bergstrom Mellon Museum and Casey for all the work you've done to put this program together um, and also the AACG for their um, tireless support of the glass art community which without them would not be anything nearly what it is today. I also want to thank um, Habitat Galleries. Uh, they were the impetus for me to make that short film. Um, Jeremy put it together, um, and I really apologize. The sound was not uh, not what it should be. We've had some technical issues, but um, but I think all in all, it was pretty good. So definitely want to thank Jeremy for for doing that. So um, speaking of Jeremy, sorry, just one second while I get there. Um, let's see. Screen. All right, so um, here's a picture of Jeremy and myself back in, um, oh, well, I guess we met in 1981 in a painting class and um, we got married in 87 and um, Jeremy was a glass major. Uh, I took a couple glass classes but um, decided that um, glass wasn't entirely what I wanted to focus on at that time, so I went on to do be a painting major and um, and do design work, and um, so eventually we moved to Wisconsin and I did start making glass. Um, so this was um, representative of my early um, attempts in glass, and you can kind of you might recognize that this is still a line I do today, but it's basically um, fruit pieces or um, things that I can color with um, powders and frits done hot. 
Um, but as I am a painter, I was always looking for ways to, um, to find um, how to use paint in glass. And so here is an early attempt at um, an early piece with um, the high fire enamels. It's um, a piece within a piece um, and it's been polished away and then it's been embedded in the molten glass. So this is about, uh, I'd say about nine inches tall, about three inches deep. Um, so from there, I um, decided to um, become more painterly, more expressive with the glass. Um, and then eventually until I could sculpt figures. And once I started sculpting figures, I had the sense of um, freedom to do a lot of uh, storytelling. So um, I began to um, respond to things I had read about and stories. and. This particular piece is about um, uh, Helena Kohler Mueller, who um, was an art collector in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And um, because she, because of her marriage um, to a wealthy man, it enabled her to start her own museum. And so she was kind of the one who really championed uh, Van Gogh early on as, as fine art and also um, Mondrian. So she has a really progressive art museum. And so I started to think about women's place in art history um, and women artists, because when I was in college, I didn't, didn't have a lot of um, representation in our art history books, at least Jansen's art history back in the eighties. I think it had about four women in all of our history mentioned. So as a, an artist myself, I was trying to figure out, well, how, how does this happen? Like, how, how can you, how can you navigate um, being an artist as a woman? Um, you know, how can you, what are your models from art history? So this is a piece that I had done um, about uh, Russian women artists in the early 20th century. Um, Jeremy had found an old book for me at a used bookstore about the Russian avant-garde women from the 1920s and 30s. And some of them in the book were even called anonymous. You know, they didn't even know who they were. So I wanted to do a tribute to, um, to these women. Um, so this was this piece. Um, so all except one of them, I, I know who they are. Um, this is a fairly current piece. This is from uh, 2017 called Tertiary Colors. And again, this is about women artists. So this is um, from left to right. It's um, Alice Neal, Florine Sedemeyer, and Elaine de Kooning. And then below them are their uh, copies or my rendition of their own seated self-portraits that they had done. So it's called Tertiary Colors because a lot of people who are familiar with art history, familiar with artists from the 20th century, still are not familiar with many women artists. So this was something that was important to me um, for a long time. Um, I also got interested in um, how they navigated their life as mothers and, um, and still having careers. This is a piece about Alice Neal and it's got her two children, one that was taken away from her on the left and then the one on the right um, she was an absent mother for. So there's a portrait of him in an empty chair. I thought there was some poetry and sad tragedy in, in a lot of these stories that I was interested in. Um, I also started thinking about um, um, the relationship between the artist and his wife. And this is called um, Georgette Magritte. Um, because when I started to research doing a piece about Magritte, I was curious about him. I saw all these amazing photographs of him and his wife, Georgette, early um, doing all these wacky, crazy things. And I realized she must have really been a big part of his creative process. And I have never, never really heard about her. So I was curious about her role in, in his life. So um, this piece is about Georgette. Um, this is a piece I did about um, Virginia, no, uh, Gertrude Stein and, um, um, her partner, um, Alice, oh, Tolkis, that's right. Um, I'd gone to the Yale um, Museum and they had um, uh, her chairs, that's what's represented in the middle, 
Um, Alice had designed these chairs. Um, Picasso did a pattern for her and then she needle pointed them. And there's two chairs there and they're in miniature. So they're very interesting. So she was really an artist as well. And um, also while I was at the museum, Gertrude Stein's vest was there. So I was able to check it out and kind of hold it up and, and look at it. So that was kind of an interesting artifact to, to have a physical contact with. Um, this is a piece that I did. Um, let's see, this is from 2009. Um, and this is um, kind of thinking about uh, Virginia Woolf and her sister Vanessa Bell uh, looking at each other and wondering, well, what if I'd gone that route? You know, because obviously Virginia Woolf has led a solitary life, um, more solitary than her sister Vanessa Bell, um, who had a very um, active household with her husband and her husband's lover and then her lover and then first kids, a just crazy household. And she was a painter, very, very talented, um, but not as known for her art as Virginia Woolf, who led a very quiet, somber life, um, is known for her work. And so I thought there must have been a time when the sisters reflected on each other's choices. And I, I thought that would be, a, it was an interesting concept to make a piece about. Um, this is another piece I did about the sisters. This is much more recent. This was in 2018. And this is called Bloomsbury Collage. And it's just different aspects and parts of their story as they each led their own individual lives. Um, and I also started thinking uh, more about marriages. And this is a piece about um, Diego and Frida um, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo that were, they were married and um, as many people know, and they had a very tumultuous dynamic partnership. He was much larger than her in, in many ways, but also physically. So I thought it might be nice to make a piece where she can kind of measure up to him in size. And, um, and then I'm also showing the back of this piece because I, I especially like it. Um, this was from 2012. Um, this is a piece that I made, I think it must have been around 2013 or 14. It was when my daughter was heading off to college and so it's a, a piece about Little Red Riding Hood and um, later in this um, talk I will go into myth and um, storytelling which is a big part of my work but um, you can see that. Hold on one second. Oh, I, Jeremy's reminding me to uh, to, to tell the size of, the, of, of these pieces. And so um, this piece is called um, Marriage Vortex and it's 41 inches tall. So it's quite tall. Um, it's about the, when people get married and they're a couple, usually it ends up that the husband has to adapt and change almost more than the wife does. Or That's been kind of my experience. And, talking to people and, um, and different stories I've heard. So I've got the man, the woman kind of floating upwards and the man's kind of tumbling down, but they're in a vortex. So you know that she'll eventually be on the upside and he'll be on the downside um, or he'll be righted. This piece um, is very reminiscent of um, Chagall. I think I was kind of inspired by a lot of his floating figures. Um, here's another piece about, it's called Anniversary, and this piece is 19 inches tall. Um, it's got a couple um, examining who they are, their identity, they're separate, but usually a marriage is considered, you know, one unit. So I thought that was kind of an interesting approach to um, looking at marriage. And so here's Jeremy and me. <laughs> So we spent a lot of time looking at each other uh, all the time in our studio. We work together and um, he, he, we have a great partnership. Um, we really help each other with our work. It's really dynamic. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's intense. It's really awesome. So this is a piece that we did together as a collaboration, um, which surprisingly enough, we do very few collaborations. Um, so this was a piece we did um, as a request from Amy Morgan for her teapot show, she particularly requested us to do a collaborative piece, which I thought was kind of charming of her to ask us to do that. Um, this piece is 16 inches tall. 
Um, it's two separate cast pieces. Uh, the inclusions are teapots. They've been painted with profiles and then they're set into the piece. Um, they're cold fused together, which is also something we don't normally do. This is the back of the piece, which um, I think is almost as dynamic as the front of the piece. And so the two profiles together become one face um, from the backside. This is a, a fairly recent piece. This is from 2019 and um, this is 16 or 15 inches by 15 inches wide and it's got um, seven components. This is called Personal Universe. Um, and um, I've got the man is on his cell phone and the woman is in contemplation. Um, the house is a universe, a book is a universe. All these elements are universes unto themselves. And so um, I was making a commentary on how it's all, um, all come together. There's also a song and I can't remember the artist's name. It's, I think it's called Personal Universe and I was listening to it. Um, maybe Jeremy will text me, maybe he'll remember what it is. Um, this is another piece about um, marriage and weddings and um, this is about looking back you know when with your the end of your life it's kind of focused on my grandfather and his looking back at remembering my grandmother and all the parts of their marriage together it's, it's kind of a sentimental piece to me um, this piece is 21 and a half inches tall so it's it's fairly large um, and I guess it's um, 12 different components all together. Is that your most ambitious piece in terms of, of number of components? No, I did one, I did one with many, with 32 components once. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah, I did a very large one, but this is up there with the bigger, the bigger, um, the bigger collections of pieces. I think that one that I showed earlier with um, Virginia Woolf and her sister was more, I think that was maybe 16 pieces. So um, this is a fairly current series called uh, On My Mind series. And so um, these figures are sculpted and I like the whimsical nature of putting something on top of their heads. It's all hot, it's all sculpted hot at once, the, the whole piece and my, Assistant Chelsea Lippman has been really invaluable to me in helping me um, sculpt these pieces and then um, paint them and then I embed them in the molten glass. These pieces are, I think, around 13 inches tall. I don't have a measurement right here, but um, so I took this series and then I've also been um, playing with um, gender roles and thinking about, about um, because I'll, reading a lot about um, non binary um, sensibility and um, kind of interested and curious about that and looking at, back through art history, actually seeing a lot of it in the 20s in the Dada's movement. And um, so this piece I have, um, this was for um, an exhibition at Tory Foliard um, that she asked people to do, um, I think it was fruit or, or nature um, or still life. That's what it was, it was still life. And so I have this, a man sort of dressed up as a woman with a still life and then a woman dressed up as a man. And so I like um, the concept of playing with gender. This piece is just from last year. Um, this is another one. So this is, this is playing with gender. Um, these are from 2016 uh, and this is 30 inches tall. Um, and this piece is Anna Ma. Um, which is from the Carl Jung's, you know, thinking, thinking about, um, you know, the masculine within the feminine consciousness. And so um, I, this is a, a set of pieces. Um, here's the back of this piece, which I particularly uh, enjoyed. So I thought I would share it. Um, and then this is the other piece. So this is the animus, which is the unconscious masculine sensibility of a woman. So, and this is the back of that piece. Um, the back of my pieces are put in with um, powders and fritz. And so I use, um, I create a stencil for the whole piece and then each piece is cast individually, but um, my stencil layout is all connected and I have a, 
a, basically a road map that shows me where each color goes so I can, I can have a continuum that way. Um, I also did a series of pieces based on transformation and um, the monster and that kind of led me into myth and mythology and so um, I was also very interested in puppetry and so I did some, I did a workshop on puppetry and there is a parallel with my glass pieces as far as um, the figures because they are 3D you know, and they move, you, you see them move a little bit. And I thought it was so interesting when you can make a puppet come to life with just such a minimal gesture of like taking a breath or just, just a bodily feature that's naturalistic. And I, I, that really spoke to me as far as making my work more natural, more, more of a storytelling, more of a message. Um, this, was, this piece is a commission that I'm showing right here um, for a family uh in colorado and they really responded to my um to my monster series my, my transformation i think especially the, the one with the bird um but this one i thought was kind of fun because i've got the man the dad on the bottom and he's got um trees growing out of his arms and then they had two twin daughters and so i turned them into this little kind of deer like animal two-headed animal and the mom who's like kind of all knowing and so she's the bird and um and then i've got their little cabin in the woods and i, I essentially when i do these tall totemic pieces um i kind of have a formula and um i usually put um i usually put a sense of spirituality um towards the top sensuality with fruit um, and then I put something about the environment that they are living in that's where I'll have like chairs or furniture or um, and then something about the actual person themselves so I have I have a little bit of a vernacular for how these pieces get assembled and what uh, what parts go in them and I was stricter in the beginning of my career and now I've gotten a little bit uh, looser this piece is called um, there were also two apples so <laughs> so this is like a, a kind of a tongue-in-cheek garden of eden um you know mythology where you know there's there's gotta be a lot of apples there right and so there's no way like she's the only one that ate the apple i just i can't believe that so i thought that was a pretty interesting take on the story so i have like snake in there and i have my my woman up there and the tree so it was kind of a fun piece. I made that last year. Um, this is a newest piece. And actually in the video, you see me um, sculpting this head. Um, so this piece is uh, 41 inches tall. So it's a bigger, it's one of the bigger um, totemic type pieces that I've done. I've actually done bigger still, but um, this is called um, Medusa Gets Her Body Back. And so I always thought that was kind of interesting to um, give, you know, they just use Medusa's head and she cast everyone to stone with her face. And so here she's cast in glass and she gets her body back. And um, let's see. Um, she gets her body back and I have her on her, um, on the bird it's written the word voice is under here and you can't really see it from this angle but so she gets her voice back um this whole piece is figurative so we've got kind of breasts on on the top and her the chairs function as hips for her um and then she's in the bottom fully fully formed as a woman and so the top is sort of the mythology of her of her face i was kind of excited about that piece um so, um, and then this is my new series also, um, this concurrent that I'm working on. Um, these are coded women and they are um, on the precipice of emerging from their vestibule or their encasement, whatever, uh, whatever is restricting them. They are on the, on the brink of emerging through the surface. Um, sometimes you can even feel part of their, their foot or their head is sort of pressing on the, is, is deeper, it's thicker than the, the depth of the piece. So it's kind of emerging from the surface. Um, and they are, uh, it's interesting when you, when I make these women, 
I have a drawing and I have an era in mind. And so the length of the sleeves, the length of the coat, the way the collar is, the way she's holding her purse, all of that information tells so much about her character. And that is something that I've always been really um, drawn to is storytelling. And it's interesting because when I paint these pieces, I will work on it and work on it. And then all of a sudden someone is looking back at me and I can, I recognize like it's, it's, it's arrived, it's there. And it's almost, it's almost like I don't have control over what the, what happens with the face. It's so, in, I work so intuitively on it that I, I, I my consciousness isn't in charge. Um, the backs of these pieces um, are like stained glass and I've been having a um, really fun time working on these elaborate patterns and um, very colorful. They're almost like uh, reminiscent of Sandra Delaunay, who is an artist I really respond to. Um, let's see, so these are 19 inches tall. And I'm just saying that, um, yeah. Okay, so anyway, so I'm also a painter. So here's me with a painting. Um, I think I, I actually, took this image for Judy Bendoff to send it to her to show her the scale of this painting. So thank you, Judy, for this uh, opportunity to take this picture. Um, so I, in my painting, um, I am concerned with color, I'm concerned with surface, and you will definitely see a link to the backgrounds of my pieces. It's definitely tied in with the graphic quality of my painting. Um, and like with my glass, I'm very interested in the luminosity the depth that gets created with hue. So I am working formally on a lot of overlapping issues with glass, but it's just, it's, it doesn't read because, because of the lack of the storytelling that's, that's not in the painting that is in the glass, um, which is beginning to um, evolve a little bit. So um, I'm sorry, I'm not saying how big these are. So these are all oil. Um, this one is 36 by 36. Um, this one is um, 36 by 48, so it's a bigger painting. Um, it's definitely more gestural. Um, and this is, um, this is one where the storytelling is starting to creep in. And so um, uh, it's beginning to creep in a little bit with the bicycle in there. Um, this one is 30 by 30. And so you can see there's a relationship that um, I'm still, you know, I'm working on both bodies of work simultaneously. Um, I do have a separate studio now. Uh, as you did see earlier in that picture, I was painting in the hot shop, which was not a good idea. So now I am over um, up the street. As you saw in the film, I have another studio where I do my painting. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this part is about just other mediums and collaborating and, um, you know, working on different concepts um, within glass. Um, so this piece is um, called Wild Nights and I think it's 22 inches tall and it was for um, a show I did at the Mesa Fine Arts Center that was all about um, em Emily Dickinson's life. Um, and um, so this is Wild Nights because she wrote a lot of her poetry um, by lamplight at night. Um, and she had a crazy handwriting. And so I took one of her, actually the handwriting from her poem, and that's been engraved into the, um, the top part of the hurricane lamp. And that's actually solid. And so she's in there and her hair's up, up and it's orange and it's like a flame. And so this was a pretty exciting piece to make. Um, and then um, I've been working with some blown work that's been made in our studio and tr working with some low fire enamels. Um, I think Dr. Hyde purchased this piece. Thank you, Jim Hyde, if you're here. Um, I worked with a woodworker to create um, a mold for me of a violin. Um, so um, I think it's part of the collaborative um, efforts. This was um, an installation that Jeremy and I did uh, last year at the Green Bay Botanical Garden. And these are about um, six feet high. The, um, the stands and the butterfly, the, the biggest butterfly is about six feet tall. Um, and then this was 
for a particular woman who had died and it was a memorial for her and she collected um, Polish pottery. So you can see some of the um, Polish pottery imagery in the flowers. Um, some of her, her children came to our studio and they did their hand uh, imprinted in the glass. So you can see like on this one leaf, there's a handprint. It's very subtle, but it's still there. So her, her two children and her husband each did one handprint. Her wedding ring is also embedded in here. So um, this is a picture from right after we did the installation. So now there is garden all around it. It's beautiful and that's how much see it. I, Unfortunately, I did not bring my camera. So next time I will take a picture of that. Um, this is just a studio piece that um, I worked on a watercolor and we translated it um, to a wall piece. That was an exciting, fun process. And um, this is um, a piece I did um, in reaction to the collection of artifacts at the Green Bay um, Museum, the Richter Museum of Natural History, and we were invited to come and respond to the collection and they had a huge amount of um, bird specimens. So this is based on a drawer of bird specimens. So I, I, I definitely look for opportunities to work in other mediums and with other artists. Um, this is um, a musician that came and did a piece and he was responding to our studio. So um, uh, his name is Tyler Damon and he's a, a percussionist from Chicago and he came and he played nonstop for a little over an hour and did, he played the bowls and then he played the bells that, um, that uh, had been blown in our studio. Um, and then he actually walked around the building and played it. So it was a conceptual piece. It was very cool. So we have a lot of musicians in Sturgeon Bay. So it's, it's a great pleasure for us to invite them into the creative process see what happens. Um, there are many more examples than this, but um, I just had this one to show you. So um, Casey uh, asked me to talk briefly, um, or he recommended I talk briefly about um, what, what Jeremy and I did in Thailand. And so, um, and please forgive me if you've already heard all about this, because we were so excited when we came back. I think we told the story a million times, but um, it was very exciting. Uh, we got an email in um, 2007 or 16, I think, um, inviting us to come and um, send a proposal to help start a glass academy in Thailand. And so uh, after a lot of working out the details, um, we ended up going and um, we, this was a factory setting. We were in the factory um, teaching and working with um, the students there. And that was um, pretty exciting. You can kind of see a little bit there. That's everybody getting, coming and going from uh, their jobs, their little offices. The studio was in this facility. This is um, BG Glass, which is a bottle making factory, one of the biggest ones in Thailand. And they wanted to have um, a hot glass shop, you know, as a centerpiece in their, in their factory. So we commissioned um, uh, John Childs from Vermont, from Hub Glass to build, um, furnace, beautiful furnace and glory hole, um, couple of kiln, a um, couple other things, and then some of the things that the Thai people built themselves. Um, this is a particular picture. Uh, once we got going, this is kind of probably one month into the whole thing, the beginning, um, they invited the Korean contingency from Nansal University, and that's, this is Professor Ko, he's, he's a pre-established glass um, artist in South Korea, and um, some of our team is there, some of the students from Korea, but you can see all the women. It's just, it was so exciting. There were so many women interested in working with hot glass. Um, some of them, one of them students, this is uh, Araya. She um, ended up coming and staying with us for um, uh, uh, two weeks. And then she went on Corning where we helped her secure um, a scholarship and, um, so that was really exciting for her. Um, a lot of these people are still in glass, definitely still making art. It was, it was a pretty exciting, um, exciting event. And this is cool. I remember they were so fascinated with what we were doing. There's Jeremy like, blowing like the first cup and you can see everybody's got their camera. And um, I'm gonna show that one more time because I think it's so cool. <laughs> it was fun. So we, we made a lot of really good friends. Um, we met a lot of really cool people. We've uh, been there. We went there 
together three times and then Jeremy went a uh, fourth time for another project. So um, we definitely have established a community there um, that they were ready to make happen. So it was, it was pretty exciting. Um, and I, you know, had limited amount of, of uh, things that I could do because I, we weren't able to do sand casting in the beginning while we were there. Eventually we were, but at the beginning we weren't. So that's when I started working with the enamels. So we found some ceramic enamels and made some pieces and, um, and then they fired them on. And it was amazing the, the level of sophistication of the students there was phenomenal. They were all very accomplished and willing to do very serious work and very thoughtful work about their own histories and the situation. And um, we were just completely um, enamored with the whole experience. Um, here's one piece I did while I was there. I was um, practicing with the enamels. Um, there's <laughs> Jeremy and me at the end. So, so um, yeah, so this is the end of, um, of our, of my presentation. So I well, we have some, we have some wonderful questions that have been asked. So if it's possible and if you need to jump back maybe to an image or something okay. yep, um, I can based do that. on specific questions, sure. um, we've left about 20 minutes worth of time for questions. So I think we should be able to get to everything. And okay. if you do still have a question, folks, you know, please feel free to ask and we'll do our very best to get to those. Um, the first question though, uh, Stephanie comes from JG Harrington. Um, he asked, can you talk a bit about the backgrounds and how they fit in with the sculptural elements of the works, uh, particularly the more abstract backgrounds? Okay, yeah, definitely. So when I go look at this one. Um, so the backgrounds, um, basically what I do is after I finish planning my story for the piece and I, I establish the mold that I'm gonna use, and then I have the, the objects figured out. The background is the last thing that I design um, because by then I kind of, you know, I, I, do, I do allow myself to work intuitively. So I, I sculpt the different pieces and see what works best in the piece and kind of sometimes things occur to me as I'm into it and I realize, oh, this is the direction that this piece should go. And so once I have all that part set aside, then I lay out the whole mold and I trace it and I just uh, do a, a drawing right on it. And now I've been doing it so often and so long, it goes very quickly. It's very, it's very fluid. And so I, I do the whole layout, the drawing, and then I decide what color everything is gonna be. And I definitely have um, a very specific palette. Um, I know what colors work better with other colors, what colors are more opaque. Um, I like to do some shading, but there's some colors that don't want to be next to other colors. So um, I always pretty much do um, an outline of the piece. So I, when I do my stencil, I put the whole stencil into the um, into the piece. I think there was one that showed it. Oh, that was in the film. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I put the whole um, stencil in, and then I sprinkle in cobalt blue powder. So you can see that's the that's the outlines. Oops, I'm sorry. Sorry. So you can see the outlines here. That's made with cobalt powder, but it's also an accumulation of all the colors that happen to land in that space. Um, when I cut out my stencils, I leave a tolerance of about an eighth of an inch so that I can easily lift them in and out of the mold, but then also that leaves me a really nice outline. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, and, and this is a question that I, I have as well, uh, but Marjorie Sutter asked, um, how long does it take for you generally um, start to finish to complete a piece like Personal Universe? Um, something uh -huh. up in terms of size and... Well, probably, I mean, if I really have to hustle, I could probably do it in two weeks. Um, you know, every time, you know, each, figure to sculpt is at least an hour or, or an hour and a half um, so of hotshot time. So I have to kind of schedule hotshot time just specifically to do that. Um, then I have to wait 24 hours um, for it to cool and then I paint it with a, enamels and then another 24 hours for it to warm up. And then I can begin to cast it that day and then it's another five to six days to cool. So 
even on like on you know a start to finish is a week and that's you know that's if i could get it all done is there a significant portion of time dedicated to to cold working in this process or is that yeah no. yeah there's definitely uh, i wasn't counting cold working sure. so yeah there's <laughs> definitely cold working um that's on the end i'm very lucky i have um Jeremy is really good at cold working and Chelsea, my assistant, she loves cold working. So I am so fortunate in that aspect. And she's excellent. They're both excellent at it. So I don't do a lot of my own cold working, but sure. um, they do that. So you mentioned, you mentioned Jeremy here. So we have a question. Um, how does having your husband as your assistant and your partner influence your artwork, um, especially since your work largely surrounds uh, women as the main subject? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think you're going to have to ask me, you know, when I'm 80, that I'll know the answer to that question. No, definitely, um, you know, definitely working together is a big part of, um, of my process. Um, I'm very lucky because um, Jeremy's very smart and he has a really good eye. And so he will see things and not let me get away with something that maybe I would you know, and same with for him, his work with me. So we're also very sensitive to be careful not to step on the other's toes. But I mean, we're constantly talking about our history, playwrights, music, like, you know, we'll be on a bike ride and be discussing uh, an art piece. You know, we, it's, it's very much a part of both of our identities and we're, our dialogue is fluid. And so we are constantly thinking and talking about art. So sure, sometimes we do disagree and sometimes it is a little bit difficult, but you know, I'm glad he cares enough to, to, to want it to be the best and, and I'm sure he feels the same way. Judy Bendoff was asking, you specifically had shown the, the teapot piece, your collaboration. Uh, do you think that you're gonna do more collaborative pieces with Jeremy? Uh, she says the teapot piece is absolutely wonderful. Oh, thank you, Judy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I mean, we did the butterfly garden. Um, we've done a couple other pieces for the teapot piece. I think we will. Um, we just, we've got a lot on our plate right now, so we don't really have time to, to do it immediately, but I think eventually we probably will. Um, Lisa Brill asks, uh, so she says she has a fabulous chair piece of yours. Awesome. Um, can you talk more about the chair theme as it relates to your work? Um, yes. Um, I wonder if I can go into any of those. I really like, um, I'm sorry, I hope everyone's not going to get dizzy from this. Um, <laughs> I like catalogs and I like um, thinking about selection and choices. So that is a big part of the chair. I'm just trying to find a chair piece. Here's one here, but um you know i like the concept of making a choice or, or a variety like choosing one, all the different ones together i've always loved catalogs i've always loved that so i think chairs are um kind of quintessential um and chairs and teapots are quintessential elements from domestic or from material culture for artists to design and um and create so they're they're the kind of perfect um subject to personify they also you know like i use them as hips in the medusa piece so they kind of work well as a metaphor for our our waist and our bodies with the, the, the legs and arms and you know there's a lot of to personify there so i love chairs um so i have a, a an anonymous question here oh. um, and it's specifically why hot casting instead of kiln casting is there a particular, you know, was there an, an event during your training that maybe led you to that? Or why why did you choose hot well, casting over kiln casting? I think because I have a hot glass shop, a hot cast, you know, I have the furnace there to use and I like the immediacy of it. Already glass to me seems less immediate than painting. And so um, kiln casting is yet even another step away. Um, but that said, I would love to try kiln casting. So I'm, I'm definitely, it's definitely on my list of things I want to get to. I want to do that and I also want to do fusing. So those are two things I haven't yet ventured into that I've been kind of on the periphery thinking about doing. Do you use a specific brand of, of 
high fire enamels? Do you have a collection of a specific brand that you like? Or? Yeah, so I have the most ragtag um, treasured collection of paradise paint um, that I have like the ends of, you know, probably, I don't know, probably 30 jars. Um, some of them, you know, are, are in better shape than others. Um, but I also use a Ruche. Um, and then John DeWitt sent me some from the Netherlands that are really nice that I use. I, I don't know the name of those. Um, but um, yeah, so, and I've used um, Faro. So I've kind of used a lot of different ones. I've had um, better luck with some than others. Some things are really difficult, like um, the reds can go brown. Um, the thing about Paradise Paint is it was just so amazing and so um, special. And that was manufactured by, or developed by David Hopper out of Paradise, California. And um, he was doing lovely um, pieces that he, he would sculpt the piece and paint it and then heat it back up and then dip it in the furnace, coat it, kind of like I did with that Emily Dickinson piece. And um, so he developed it, but then he wasn't, um, he decided not to pursue it anymore. And I know Bertil Valine also used it a lot. Um, so I think, you know, he had a couple of big customers and I was one of his main customers for sure. Um, and then he stopped and he said he had a few odd uh, jars around, um, but then there was the fire in paradise. And um, I don't think he lost his stuff then, but wasn't able to get any more after then. So, but anyway, sure. he's a wonderful person. Um, Mary Ellen Vixta was just asking if, if you've considered doing a video talking about the stories uh, behind each piece, not necessarily how you make things. Um, obviously, we know what kind of time goes into the videography and, and, and creating just a five minute video, uh, but have you considered something along those lines or has that been something that has ever been requested of you? No, I would love that. I would love to do that. Um, yeah, because the stories are really meaningful to me and there's many more pieces than this. This is just, I don't know, like maybe 10% maybe of my work. Um, so I have a lot of stories. You can see my voice is already kind of going a little bit. So. Well, and <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would love to do a video of, of all the um, stories or at least the ones, maybe the ones more about art history or um, and I'd like to get more stories because I want to keep making work. We, I enjoyed getting to come up and, and film you. We all ultimately didn't use any of the footage that I used, but I think it's, it's an, just amazing to, to see your process in person. I think some of the folks that are attending tonight have had the great fortune of, of being able to visit your studio and yeah. visit the hot shop and, and see how you go about working and see the space that you're able to create in. Um, I was fortunate enough when I visited uh, to actually go to Stephanie's painting studio as well, the space down the street, um, as well as their their new building um, just across the street. Um, so it's it's really spectacular to see what all goes into to this process, or or really just to see a a small part of what goes into the process. Um, Nancy Mulleroy was asking. Um, she mentioned, um, I'm interested to see apples and pears appear in so many of your pieces. Uh, so like Georgette and Personal Universe, right. for example. Um, you mentioned the sensuality you associate with fruit. Can right. you speak a little bit more about that? Why, why pears and apples specifically? Um, well, I also do cherries, um, plums. I've done bananas. Um, I even did an eggplant once. So I, I just like fruit in general. I love the colors. Um, the there's sort of like um, a notation for me or it's just in my vernacular. It's something that I've been doing for a long time. So it's part of my language. Um, I like the sensuality. I, I, I still like them. I'm not, I never get sick of them. So I do put them in a lot. Um, yeah. So it, you, you talked about the chair um, and you've yeah. talked about the fruit a little bit. How about uh, another piece of imagery that is, it seems to be used repetitively or you know frequently um is the purse is there oh. is there a particular uh, thought to why the purse makes it uh, times? well i think the purse is part of fashion and apparel along with the hats and um and the coats so i think that's part of that sensibility um another image i use a lot um you know 
are the houses. I have houses a lot, um, flowers a lot, moons a lot. Um, basically like things that I can, you know, use as vehicles to get paint on. You know, in art history, you see a lot of the use of um, clothing and, and accessories to tell stories and, and it's very expressive. It tells a lot more about something or about how we perceive something. Um, so I think they're very provocative and that's also why I use them. Um, Certainly. Yeah. I have. Uh, Jan Smith was wondering about process specifically, uh, Stephanie. Um, she was asking if you fire your enamels before encasing uh, the, the painted pieces. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, Jan. Um, yes, I do. So the pieces are sculpted. Um, the following day, um, if I work in consecutive days, they're painted. Um, and then I put the piece into a kiln and we, um, we bring it up to about 950 overnight in a vented kiln so that the gas can release. Um, if I don't release the gas, I'll get a big gas bubble underneath the molten glass when I pour over it. Um, so then we do fire them. Um, so then we, we punty them up from the kiln, fire them in the glory hole, which is even hotter, you know, about, probably about 2000, and then um, put it back in the kiln where we get it ready for in, putting it in the casting and inclusion. Wonderful. Um, I think we have time maybe for two more questions. I'm sorry that we necessarily haven't gotten to, to everyone. I've tried to get to, to some that I thought would have some, you know, broader answers as well. Uh, but uh, there was a question from Dee Bittman. Um, have you considered, uh, you know, going to a, a foreign country and, and doing another project similar to the project in Thailand, maybe oh, wow. in 2022 or, you know, after, yeah. after the pandemic has, has maybe subsided? Yeah, I mean, we kind of were playing around with an idea of trying to get a project going in China. Um, we would love to. We really we both thrive on new cultures and experience and meeting people and going to Thailand was so special. And I have to say, Dee Bittman, I, I did a really, really wonderful um, commission for her. I can say it's wonderful because she gave me all these crazy elements to put in her piece from um, the Moiré culture to egrets to children to, to houses and trees and um, painkillers and it was in the globe and um, it turned out to be a really, really fun piece. So thank you, Dee, for that. That was really a pleasure. Well, and thank you for attending uh, yeah. tonight, Dee. Thank you for your question. Jeremy mentioned I did, I did get to teach in Amsterdam, which was wonderful. Um, that was a short project, but that was great. And we've taught at Corning. So we love to travel and teach. So we're looking forward to when the world will invite us again. Sure, sure. Well, um, Stephanie, I think we're, we're about at the end of our time today. Uh, real quick, I, I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for taking your time to be able to share your story uh, with, uh, you know, as many at one point as time, in time as seven, uh, 62 participants. So there, I, I told you at the end. Um, <laughs> so um, we are thrilled to have you. We're thrilled to have uh, works of yours in the permanent collection of the museum. Uh, the Bertram Mahler Museum of Glass is open right now, and so we uh, absolutely would love to welcome you to the museum. If you're if you're local here in Wisconsin, you know we're located in Nina in the Fox Valley. Um, if you're not local but you find yourself in Wisconsin, we'd love to see you. I'm sure Stephanie and and Jeremy would also love to have you. I would recommend you know if you do decide to go and visit their absolutely wonderful studio in Door County, calling ahead just to make sure that they are <laughs> in fact there. Um, again, want to thank the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass uh, for allowing us to uh, be able to offer this program. Uh, we're really quite thrilled with the turnout tonight as with other nights. Um, I will let you know that we have another presentation, another AACG uh, Wisconsin Artist Series presentation that will run on September 17th uh, with Sheboygan Falls artist, Beth Littman. And so I would uh, absolutely love to see everyone uh, that turned out tonight to come and see Beth's program as well. More information about that program will be posted on the museum's Facebook page, as well as the museum's website, which is bmmglass.com. Any closing thoughts, Stephanie? 
I just want to thank everybody. I see some names here now. I can see the names and hi Nick and hi Susan, um, Susan Glass and Linda Dillman. I see all kinds of wonderful people. So I'm so appreciative and thank you, Casey, for doing such a great job. This was really fun. It's so fun to be able to talk about my work. It's a thrill. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you for thank you for agreeing to participate. Thank you for being flexible with regards to the date. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to working with you and Jeremy uh, here in the future. Okay. Thanks, Casey. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Look forward to seeing you on September the 17th. Okay. Good night.